All right, thanks so much. Welcome everyone to the OPSC, it's the Online Peace Science Colloquium. Uh, my name is Cassie Dorf. I'm an assistant professor over here at Vanderbilt University. I run the OPSC with Brad Smith, who's also at Vanderbilt University, and Jennifer Barnes, a PhD student at Vanderbilt as well. We're all here. Um, today, we're really excited. We have a presentation by Brandon Bolte at Penn State University. Uh, he is um, on, on the job market, right? Right, um, PhD candidate getting ready to get out there. And he's presenting work entitled How Rebels Cooperate, Internal Bargaining, Credibility, and the Design of Alliance Contracts in Multi-Party Civil Wars. We are very lucky to have three outstanding discussants joining us today. It'll be Kathleen Cunningham from the University of Maryland, Kanisha Bond from Binghamton University, and Emily Gade from Emory. Hello, y'all. So we will get started with our presenter in just a moment. If you are here and you're tuning in, you're watching this presentation live, we encourage you to drop some questions in the Q&A box. Um, just type those in there. I'll be checking those. If there's a moment for me to bring them into discussion, we'll ask Brandon or our discussants about those questions. Uh, if there isn't, we'll still retain all that information that you've put in the Q&A and we'll send it to Brandon so that he's able to get that helpful feedback and maybe even correspond with you after the webinar is over. With that said, Brandon, go ahead and present for your 15 minutes and then we'll dive into our discussion. All right. Can everybody hear me still? Yes. Great. All right. I will share my screen. Okay. All right. And then everybody can see this. Looks great. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as Professor Dorf said, my name is Brandon Bolte, and I'm a PhD candidate at Penn State University. And today I'm going to present uh, a section of my dissertation research about different types of alliances between rebel organizations during civil wars and why rebel leaders choose them. To give a little context, about half of all civil conflicts in the world have at least two rebel organizations. And these multi-party conflicts tend to be a lot longer and deadlier than wars um, between the government and just one rebel group. One of the reasons that rebels are so hard to defeat in these conflicts is that rebels often form alliances with each other against the state by pooling their resources, sharing intel, coordinating joint attacks, et cetera. And even though these, these alliances kind of shift a lot over time, such co cooperation generally has the effect of boosting the capabilities of the participating groups relative to the government. But beyond the decision to cooperate or not, what is interesting is that rebel alliances take a variety of different forms. So we know that the MNLF in the Philippines has been cooperating with the Abu Sayyaf group for years, even though they publicly deny it. On the other hand, in Guatemala, the leaders of four insurgent groups formed the URNG, which is which had a kind of general command institution as well, um, comprising each faction's leader. So understanding the design of rebel alliances, then it's important because it can have real consequences for rebel survival. And on the flip side of the coin, how hard it is for governments to defeat an insurgency. Now I'll return to that point at the end, but for now, I'm just interested in explaining why we see different types of rebel alliances. And if some types of alliances then produce better outcomes or gains for rebels, why don't they just always choose that type? Scholars are um, starting in, in recent years to kind of investigate why rebels choose to cooperate rather than not cooperate. And most explanations tend to share the story um, in some way about how rebel groups can reduce credible commitment problems with each other because rebels often have incentives to betray their alliance partners when windows of opportunity open or shifts in relative power occur, perhaps even because of the gains produced through cooperation. And what that means is that even if cooperation can be beneficial to participating groups, it also entails trade-offs and some risks as well. That said, again, not all cooperation is the same, and we don't know a ton about why rebel leaders choose to cooperate in different ways. So over the past few years, and I've been studying the different ways that rebels cooperate and form alliances. And I've relied upon a variety of sources, including uh, primary documents obtained from rebel websites, 
rebel magazines and bulletins and some international archives as well. And from there, I've developed a new kind of conceptual framework that uh, represents the variation in rebel alliance design and the kind of ways that rebels can cooperate. And I'm just gonna focus on one dimension of that today. So one form of cooperation is what I call incidental cooperation. And that's when groups commit joint attacks or engage in other forms of um, coordination against the government, but they don't make this kind of public commitment to cooperate and sustain cooperation in the future. So this type of cooperation can still certainly be beneficial, at least in the short run, but without public commitments, it tends to just be a little bit more fleeting over time. Alternatively, rebels can choose to form a contractual alliance, which is a public agreement often written and signed by rebel leaders to form an alliance and continue cooperating in the future. I call these uh, commitments contractual because they tend to have an agreement, be in agreement with specific provisions that kind of lay out the scope of expected cooperation between groups. So whether a rebel alliance contract has provisions for political or military or both types of cooperation, the rebel or the provisions themselves then can be formal or institutional. So formal then are these where these groups um, simply publicly commit to cooperating, but that's about it. And then institutional provisions establish some kind of power sharing mechanism or structure for coordinating the efforts of the alliance, such as a joint military council, for instance. So here's uh, the alliance agreement that formed the National Redemption Front in Sudan. And in addition to laying out some, some uh, common political principles, the leaders of the member groups decided to form an executive council with a, a rotating presidency and then this general secretariat responsible for daily executive affairs. Now, in particular, I think these institutional alliance types are kind of the most interesting because they optimize coordination between groups. Forming these codified institutions or power sharing mechanisms clarifies expectations about future interactions and reduces transaction costs or communication problems that might make coordinated efforts less efficient. At the same time, though, these benefits only really come about at the expense of each rebel leader's individual autonomy over decision making. So because rebel leaders are sharing power in some way, they oftentimes have to uh, compromise on certain issues. And over time, we, we might even see kind of intra-alliance dependencies develop that could actually be devastating to individual factions if the coalition falls apart. So what this means is that although institutional provisions can be the most beneficial, rebel leaders will also be more hesitant to agree to them if they don't trust that the other groups involved are gonna hold up their end of the deal. Oops. So to match this framework, then I've compiled a new data set on the incidents and characteristics of rebel cooperation in multi-party conflicts across the globe. And the subset of data that I'll use for this analysis includes over 230 distinct rebel organizations from the UCDP armed conflict database spread out across over 1,100 rebel dyad year observations. But the data set is more detailed than what I'm just showing you here, but just to give a sense of the variation of interest today, we can see that institutional alliance provisions are by far the most common in the data. And I suspect um, this is for two reasons, right? So on the one hand, this is consistent with the idea that they are the most strategically beneficial for rebels, but they also tend to just last a lot longer. So some of this, this frequency is just due to kind of the temporal durability of these types of provisions. And beyond the conceptual contribution of this framework, the next contribution I wanna make is theoretical. And I start from the observation that decisions about how to cooperate are ultimately made by the leadership and also that rebel leaders don't make strategic decisions in a vacuum. Instead, rebel leaders often need to retain the support of other kind of lower level military officers, which I'll just generally refer to as sub commanders, who are responsible for directly supervising and commanding factions in the battlefield or in battlefield operations. Rebel leaders are dependent upon sub commanders because of their frontline efforts. But the subcommander class across rebel organizations also vary in the extent to which they can hold leaders accountable for taking actions that they might approve of. 
And I'm gonna argue then that this internal distribution of power is yet another source of credibility or a lack thereof that can affect the types of alliances rebel leaders can commit to. So very, very, very generally, right? Rebel organizations range from being highly centralized to highly fragmented. These highly centralized groups tend to have hot, rigid hierarchical structures and efficient information flow. And leaders have uh, considerable control over their units because they can easily punish them like lower level members who decide to not follow orders. Other organizations are highly fragmented with most decision-making power really distributed to sub-commanders that oversee their kind of disparate factions. So sub-commanders in these organizations have considerable autonomy over decisions, and they are, they're more likely to be very difficult to control from the center. And then there's these rebel organizations kind of somewhere in the middle, right, where leaders have some degree or a reasonable degree of authority, really, but sub-commanders are also politically empowered, either through formal internal structures or because they just simply have some kind of degree of de facto influence due to their ability to credibly threaten the leadership in some way. The consequence of this is that strategic policies made by these groups should be more stable because more internal actors have a meaningful say over decisions that are made. So my argument then is that these types of rebel organizations with a relatively empowered subcommander class are on average gonna be more uh, credible alliance partners ex ante, which makes them more likely to be involved in more committed forms of alliances with other rebel groups. So we kind of break this down bit by bit. Leaders of highly centralized groups are not gonna be good, good uh, alliance partners ex ante because they can easily pull out of an alliance whenever the opportunity arises and the whole group will just kind of follow orders, right? They might, the leaders actually might want to cooperate, but other rebels might be kind of wary of their independence and their ability to quickly betray them in the future if they want. Fragmented groups then also aren't good alliance partners because a leader can uh, commit to cooperating, but they may not be able to rein in any kind of the sub commanders that don't really want to participate. So cooperation of these kind of groups is probably going to be inefficient at best. When the distribution of power between the central leadership and subcommanders is a, is a bit more equal, right? Each can credibly threaten each other for poor performance. So leaders are going to be cautious about the um, cautious to commit to potentially costly alliances unless they have the support of their lower cadres. And after forming an alliance, these groups require more voices to change that policy. So all of this together just leads me to expect that these organizations are going to be more trustworthy cooperating partners, ex ante, meaning that these groups are gonna be more willing to formulate deeper power sharing alliance agreements with each other than other groups and less likely to pull out of them. So from this, then we can expect, um, I can drive a few hypotheses, right? So the first is that these highly centralized and highly fragmented groups are going to be less likely to participate in institutional alliances or contractual alliances with institutional provisions and more likely to participate in lower cost like incidental cooperation. Second, I expect that dyads of moderately centralized groups are going to be more likely to form these institutional type provisions. And then third, I expect that this kind of middling category, maybe that where one moderately centralized group and then one centralized or fragmented group should be more likely to form formal alliances. And that's just kind of based on this idea that formal alliances might serve as a stepping stone to deeper cooperation where there might be some credibility within the diet, but not, not enough for groups to just accept significant autonomy costs. To test my hypotheses, I use my new data set on rebel alliance types, as well as a revised and updated version of the central control strength variable from the non-state actor data set, which is an ordinal scale from one to three. But those of us who have used these data indeed know that they are far from perfect, but the variable does broadly capture some of the kind of core organizational dynamics that I'm, I'm interested in here. To keep things simple, then I'm just gonna use separate logistic regressions for each form of cooperation or alliance provision. And that's because the contractual provisions themselves aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. And then I would control for a bunch of other things that we affect, think affect cooperation, 
I've also been working on using some more complex network models as well, and I'm happy to talk about my progress on those in the discussion. Now, the results in the paper are far more expansive and therefore a little bit different than what I'm going to show here, but I just want to isolate some simple core findings. So here I'll just plot the coefficient estimates for three pairwise combinations of groups of interest, um, along with the type of cooperation that they're most likely to be participating in, given that they have chosen to cooperate in some way. And again, my main prediction here is that pairs of moderately centralized groups are going to make for more credible alliance partners, whereas both fragmented and highly centralized groups should be less attractive candidates for those types of institutional provisions. And we can see that that's my results are largely consistent with those expectations, right? So pairs of these moderately decentralized groups tend to be involved with these alliances with institutional provisions. Having just one moderate group in a pairing is associated with formal alliance provisions. And then fragmented and centralized groups tend to cooperate incidentally. And this last result isn't, exact, isn't as good as I'd like, but at least we do see some kind of a pretty strong pattern where these groups are highly unlikely to participate in institutionalized alliances. And in fact, in my data, I actually have almost no cases of pairs of uh, highly centralized groups that agree to an institutionalized alliance provision. So just to summarize the takeaways here, right? Rebel cooperation is not a binary phenomenon. Leaders design cooperation agreements in very different ways. And this variation is interesting because Clearly, rebel leaders make calculated decisions over the types of provisions that they're willing to commit to. And I've argued that part of the, this decision calculus is the types of political constraints that rebel leaders face in their own organizations. Moreover, just to kind of reiterate a point I briefly alluded to earlier, understanding how rebels design alliances is important because certain types can really help a rebellion endure. In fact, if we look at the conflict outcomes that we see in my data, Right, we see some kind of striking patterns. Cooperation in general seems to really help uh, rebels win their war, and groups involved in an institutional alliance are almost never outright defeated. It's just that the problem with these types of provisions is that they entail sacrifices on the part of each group, and thus rebel leaders are often hesitant to agree to these types of provisions with groups if there aren't some kind of constraints to keep them from defecting. So that's all I have for you today. I am a Star Wars nerd, so I had to throw in a little Rebel Alliance logo at the end. Um, but thank you all for um, coming and I look forward to your feedback. With respect to the kind of feedback that I would really like, um, this is kind of uh, a merger of a couple of chapters in my dissertation um, and forms a version of my job market paper. And so I'm really open to any kind of feedback, especially theoretically. I'd really like to understand, come up with some ways to kind of test the, each step of this process a little bit better. Um, and more generally, I recognize for those of you who read the paper, you, you know that there are a lot of moving pieces. And so figuring out how to kind of best streamline this and, and what the next steps are for this paper would be really valuable as well. Awesome, thank you. And thanks for that presentation. So. We'll just go around and we'll collect some comments from your discussants. So we'll start with Kathleen and, and again, just let everyone kind of weigh in on their main points and then we'll open it up and really try to get a discussion going about this paper. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Um, thanks, Brandon, for the presentation. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see this project before. Uh, I really like it. I think this is an exciting project. Um, I'm gonna give you mostly critical comments here uh, designed primarily to kind of push on some of the assumptions you're making in the theory. Um, I'm also, I, as you said, you were thinking about, you know, how to streamline this for a paper. That is definitely one of the biggest logistical comments that I had in reading it was that you're asking the reader to just hold a lot in their head, um, too much for one paper. Um, and I know this is a dissertation, so that's not at all a surprise. There's a lot of great parts to this. And so I think I'll try to give a little more thought during this conversation to what could be the uh, permutations of all these elements of the argument um, that would kind of be packaged best in, in article format. Um, but let me give um, just some, some general comments I had while reading it, and I look forward to the conversation. Um, so um, 
I think the the language of alliances is really interesting. Uh, I can see where that comes from in the project. And you draw to some extent on the work on state alliances, but I think that because you're moving us towards incidental from incidental cooperation to more formal alliance structures, some of those assumptions I think are kind of seeping in in ways that could be problematic or could be interesting to explore. Um, so I'm just going to note a few points along those lines. So one of the statements in the paper is that uh, to be credible, alliances must increase probability of victory uh, and participants must incur audience costs if they defect. And you cite FIRA 97 and MARO 2000. And it's not clear to me that these, this is true for rebel alliances. This is certainly something I think we believe about state-based alliances, but I wasn't clear that this is an assumption that needs to be made about rebel cooperation. So I, I thought maybe we could talk about that today. Um, and then along the same lines, one of my thoughts in reading this was that uh, the, one of the primary functions of alliances is deterrence. And it's not clear that this would ever be a function of alliances for rebel actors. So I wondered if there wasn't an analog in state behavior and alliance patterns or something like wartime alliances that might better capture work on state alliances that could be relevant to your argument here. Um, because the, the sort of standard approach, I think, to state alliances doesn't translate super well to this behavior um, as we think about functionality. Um, and then uh, as you were speaking, I sort of added another note uh, to my comments here about whether alternatively the primary function of alliances for rebels is about signaling power to the state and signaling power and capacity to the international community. Um, and, and is there a way to think about um, that is the primary function uh, of these alliances if you're not doing so already. Um, along those same lines, uh, a lot of my comments I think are, are sort of on the same track. Um, I wondered how we might think about negotiating blocks uh, in conflict resolution processes as intersecting with your theory, right? These are alliances of a sort or they're cooperation of a sort, but they're not about military performance, but they can be really important to understanding power um, in these conflicts. Um, and uh, I would love to hear you talk more and hear everybody else's thoughts on the logic of audience costs and the role that it's playing in your argument. Um, in my mind, audience costs is a very specific kind of mechanism, and it's not the same as reputational costs, which I think is, is what you're generally talking about. So that um, is something we could delve into. Uh, and then uh, since Cassie gave us a pre-admonishment not to speak for too long, I'm just going to give one more comment, uh, which is uh, I'd love to hear everyone think about some of the other externalities of rebel alliances that we might care about as conflict scholars or people in uh, the peace building community writ large. Um, it, you know, if we think about this as just sort of contained power dynamics, that's one uh, area of interest. But, you know, do these alliances spread technology or information? Um, does this kind of cooperation and how durable it is or how institutionalized it is create greater or lesser challenges for conflict management? Uh, I'd love to see some of the implications of this really novel approach and uh, data that you've done kind of drawn out for, um, for the conflict community more broadly. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Do we? Um, oh, do we I saw Emily unmute. Sorry, I was gonna. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't see you. You're good. You're good. Who knows what we're doing? It's the land of Zoom, <laughs> right? We're still in this weird vortex. Okay, I um, really enjoyed this. Um, so great job. I think the question in particular is really on point. Um, I'm super excited to see where this is headed. I liked your kind of broad conceptualization around incidental formal and institutional alliances. I agree with everything Kathleen said. Um, I do think you need to break this up and focus on like chunking it out a little bit. There's a lot going on, but all really cool. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of my theoretical comments because I think Kathleen really covered that. Um, but I do have a couple of additional small theoretical points. 
Um, I think there's something going on in your different conceptualizations here that might be about time or duration. And I thought you could draw that out just a little bit more explicitly, or if it's not, then say that it's not. Um, I thought the concept of centralization could be more clearly defined. Um, I also think that there's something, there might be features about conflicts themselves that really are dictating which kind of collaboration is going to be most helpful for rebels um, that I thought could be handled more carefully, both theoretically and empirically. Um, and my main comments actually are about data. So not to knock UCDP, and I know you acknowledge it, and I thought your appendix section one did a really good job of that, but I think that there are some reasons to really be suspicious of the types of relationships that are captured in terms of especially incidental rebel cooperation in that data set. And I would have liked to see you handle that a little bit more carefully, um, especially if you're gonna claim that this kind of data is really getting you at counts of observations of these different levels of collaborative behavior. And I, I don't think that's true in all of the conflicts that you're talking about. So the conflict that I've been working with the most is Syria. And I used UCDP as a, as a checkpoint for my own Syria data sets. And you know, more than 50% of their observations are things like Syrian government versus Syrian insurgents. I mean, they just are really not resolved and are there's a huge amount of the proportion of the conflict if you exclude those observations, that's gonna be missing, but might be really important for understanding rebel-rebel dynamics. And I don't think it's random missingness, right? It's gonna be smaller groups or types of collaboration that weren't reported in the news or that were illicit collaboration attempts among rebels. And so I see that a lot in rebel social media data that they illicitly collaborate with other rebels. Like sometimes they're very explicit about their tactical collaboration and other times they're intentionally not. And so I would have liked to see a little bit of thought about about that from a data perspective. Um, uh, one way to think about potentially handling that um, is to scope your conflict. So I think that rebel rebel relationships in Syria are so messy and complex, you know, but you have you the case examples that you use are from conflicts that are a lot simpler. So perhaps it's worth just considering if you want to maybe exclude some of these incredibly networked, really messy conflicts as you start to build out this theory and then think about the conditions under which you think those same dynamics might apply more broadly. Um, because from a Syria perspective, I was a little bit suspicious that you really could map those with the data that you had. Um, and the other thing that you could consider is like a sensitivity analysis where you really muck with that and like give an honest assessment of the UCDP aspects of that conflict and like how many of them have these like general insurgent tags where it's not really clear who's being captured in those incident level data. Um, yeah, okay, that's enough out of me. It's really interesting. I can't wait to see where it goes. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm up. Brandon, this is awesome. I am super excited to see this line of inquiry living, um, especially coming out of Penn State. I think you did a, a doing a really good job with this. So some of the, all of the comments that I'm gonna make, they're largely gonna be based in the argumentation. And some of these are kind of questions that I've gotten over time. And so part of it is, this is an area where I think there's a lot of really good opportunity to be able to push a little harder than you have. Um, and so I don't want you to think that sort of I'm giving you these questions with an answer already predetermined. Okay. So the first kind of obvious, I think, question for me was why are we only focusing on design and not focusing on initiation first? Um, and this is partly because of that like canonical question about sort of institutional design. Do actors create the institutions that they think are gonna work or do they create the institutions that they're just able to get other people to agree to or other actors to agree to? So some of the underlying politics of coordination, I think in a general, like at a high level could be better addressed. I don't know if it shows up in the dissertation elsewhere, um, or if this is maybe just a point where you wanna do a little bit more thinking, but I would really encourage you to really kind of justify why we're gonna kind of jump into the process in the middle. Um, related to that, and I think related to Kathleen's point about sort of expectations of alliance behavior based in state behavior, this kind of looms large, I think, over the entire sort of specter of thinking about inter-rebel relationships. This is like expectation that they act like states or because they're in conflict and that's what states do or they don't act like states but we don't know what to analogize them to 
I don't know that we actually need to analogize. This is an opportunity maybe to build some real theory about rebel organizations sui generis that this is an opportunity for you to just kind of get jump in, I think, and, and sort of maybe shoot for the fences on this. There are two ways you can think about it, right? So you could try to use sort of the, the logic of interstate um, relationships. In the past, the way that I've done this is to think about what kind of states do I think rebel organizations or violent non-state actors analogize to? So the analogy I was used was small states or weak states. I don't really know that that's appropriate, but it was a way to anchor this particular organization in this broader literature where we might not necessarily expect that the same sorts of expectations or preferences or implications are gonna hold. Another way to do it is to go full bore into organization theory. Um, the logic of cooperation can be different depending on which one you, you sort of gravitate towards. But again, kind of building on, I think Kathleen's comment, I would encourage you to think about where you want to locate this actor, right? If you want to give us a, a brand new sort of theory of decision making and behavior, or if you really want to leverage um, leverage something that's pre-existing. In the interest of time, just a, I, I know we've got more time, so just a couple of um, small things. Well, maybe not small. What are you doing with multilateral relationships? So I noticed that the conversation is either about an individual organization's preferences or likely behavior or a dyadic relationship, which I get. However, most of the time, in my experience, these relationships, bilateral relationships, are nested within a multilateral relationship. And that multilateral relationship can have a very different set of underlying politics. For example, the URNG example that you give, which is one that I have relied on a lot. I think it's a great one in a lot of ways. It's really well documented. The politics seem pretty transparent. There were different bilateral relationships among all four of the constituent organizations that themselves changed over time and partly were negotiated through the development of the general secretariat. So in this way, this kind of picks up Emily's point, I think, on time, and then also kind of brings in a little bit more of the volatility in the institutional relationships, simply based in number. One way you might think about this is going to the international institutions literature and see how they deal with bilateral versus multilateral, for example, trade relationships. Again, the scope conditions are going to be different. There'll be a different set of underlying expectations about the politics of coordination, but at least you'll be able to see some example of how to deal with that nestedness. The last point here that I'll make is I wonder if you can show us some evidence of the intra-organizational bargain that's at the core of your story. So that's what I was looking for the whole time, right? Can you show me what is going on between sort of central leadership and the sub-commander class systematically over time such that I would believe that what's happening is leaders are choosing um, inter-organizational cooperation to solve an internal collective action problem and not simply responding to the external collective action problem among all of these potential competitors in the conflict. So we can talk more about that if, if you'd like, if it makes sense later, but I think I'll leave it there. This was super exciting to read. Great job. Thank you so much. Thanks y'all, those were great comments. And I'll just say to those who are watching live, again, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A and I'll try to bring them into the discussion uh, as organically as possible. Um, Brandon, you're welcome to kind of, again, respond a little bit to these in the sense of encouraging discussion. I will just point out that all three of your of your discussants were interested in a, in a bigger conversation um, about some of your assumptions, assumptions about what these alliances really are. And I think that this speaks to the multilateral question that both got brought up by Kanisha and Emily. And, and as you know, as a network person, I think about that a lot too. So. Um, that's one area that you could think about uh, spending some time on, but there are certainly area, areas that you might be more interested in. So I'll turn that to you. Yeah. Wow, this is all great. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I guess I'll just address a couple of points um, and then we can open up that discussion because I'm really interested in having that. Uh, one thing I did want to say is that um, uh, Kathleen mentioned this kind of multi-party peace processes and other kinds of consequences of these alliances, and that is uh, a, another chapter in my dissertation. So, so th these are some things that I'm thinking about. Um, 
I will actually be presenting that paper at ISA if anybody out there is going. Um, so one thing that I find that's really interesting, so this paper is kind of focused on the decision to either just kind of cooperate in kind of low commitment ways or to commit to these kind of power sharing institutions that, that require some more dedication. But the other dimension of the kind of conceptual framework that I build is that these contractual alliances can have political provisions, military provisions, or both. So sometimes, for example, we'll say, they'll just say, we're going to cooperate on the battlefield, right? Sometimes they build these negotiation blocks. And so that enters into the, the story as a political type alliance. And what I'm showing in this other paper is that both types of provisions actually um, seem to be associated with an increased probability of multilateral negotiations, right? which is probably unsurprising. But then once we get past that negotiation stage, so once negotiations have happened with the government, um, military type provisions are associated with a very low likelihood of kind of, of that turning into a multilateral peace settlement. Whereas these negotiating blocks that are kind of political cooperation agreements are associated with a higher likelihood of these, these multilateral peace settlements. And so I have kind of a, you know, a story about that, uh, but I did wanna say that there do seem to be some of these kind of broader peace building consequences to these coalitions um, that again, we can, we can talk about a lot more um, as well. So- Kathleen, did you wanna jump in on that point before he moves on? So, yeah, well, so the, I mean, I'm excited that you're doing that part of the project. I'm excited to read more about that. I actually, as you were talking about this, had a hopefully not unrelated thought that's derailing, but I think it kind of circles back to what, um, this is the, the like risks you're taking with this format. Um, so, <laughs> so one thing, you know, you're talking about all these amazing uh, aspects that you're focused on, right? About the ways that rebels cooperate, um, and the implications of that. I mean, it's just, it's a, as we noted at the very outset, like it's a big project. Um, so one, I think one way or one path forward maybe for like this paper is that you structure it such that you are um, very clear about the incentives that these rebels have to engage in these more formal institutional alliances, really lay out the benefits for us. And then you're making the argument that there are real constraints on their ability to do so that are based on internal structure, right? Only some kinds of dyads or some pairs or some types of rebel groups are actually able to do this given these incentives. And what you can do with that is to set it up such that only certain kinds of conflicts are likely amenable to these um, positive uh, returns on these kinds of um, commitments. And so it gets, I think, a little bit at Kanisha and Emily's comments about, you know, this not happening sort of in the ether, right, that, that there are real um, conflict level dynamics that might be driving whether that's these multi um, lateral nested relationships or, you know, conflicts that are, are so complicated, you can't do this. And so the returns won't be there for that, right, but that mm -hmm. you're going to set up a, a scenario where you do see there being real incentives to engage in these formal alliances, despite the costs, um, mm -hmm. but only certain kinds of organizations are able to do that. And that seems to me to get a little bit at Kanisha's point about your actual, like your um, mechanism, right? About the sub commanders and commander relationships that you can actually dig into that more specifically and, and put some parameters on this piece specifically. Um, Can I jump in with a super quick two finger on this? So I I actually think that that's the core of what's going on here, Brandon, right? Because either you, I don't know if it's either or, are, but you wanna think about it. Do you wanna tell a conflict story or do you wanna tell a rebel organization story, right? And so, you know, if it's something about the conflict, then yeah, there's gonna be real specific sort of political bounds and, and sort of operational bounds on what we're gonna expect is gonna be influencing decision-making. But if this is a different story, right? If this is about sort of, you know, the logic of rebel leader survival, or if this is about mm -hmm. sort of the development of a stable sort of oppositional field, 
or mm. if this is, I know you're only dealing sort of with groups that are sort of fighting the same, largely, right? The same opponent in the same country, mm. but there's a significant logic to rebel cooperation that is not bounded by sort of national boundaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That story isn't necessary to tell if you're telling mm -hmm. a conflict centric story, mm -hmm. but if you're telling an organization centric story, it is. Um, and, and that might help um, sort of you figure out sort of where to invest a little bit more deeply and where to maybe just do some footnoting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, y'all. And I know, Brandon, you were you were also going to address something else, and we allowed for some discussion on that point. I think that was really helpful feedback. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I was just going to, it seems like everybody also, I am very interested in hearing about, you know, ideas about how to address this, um, not problem, I guess, but this phenomenon of multilateralism and these kind of really complicated relationships when there's multiple actors and these kind of nested actors. I think all of these kind of ideas are really useful. So I, I'm open to suggestions because, you know, um, methodologically, there are certain things, right, we can do, right? So we can kind of capture these higher order dependencies by explicitly modeling them, or we can just kind of account for them, right, um, with network models and stuff, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm working on doing, and there aren't a whole lot of major changes, right, to the, to the overall results of these. Now, that's just, you know, big picture, looking at, at the at the data. But theoretically, this is this is it's a tough problem. And I I I guess I just I don't know I haven't I haven't come up with a really good solution to this yet. So any feedback you all have, I, I I'm really open to. I think I saw both Emily and Kathleen raise some hands on this. I can't Looks like Kathleen not in the same room so I can't tell what these hand motions mean. Um <laughs> my job. Uh okay, um yeah, I think I think this is a great question. Um, I think Kanisha's sort of I don't know if it's a recommendation her her uh, proposal that you could do an organizational based approach might get at this. Um, and I'm interested to hear what others think. I think you know as we think about um, like um so I one of the questions I had in the um, in my read through was whether this was monadic or dyadic in nature, because so much of the work that's going on in conflict studies is dyadic or, or multi-party. Um, but your theory, you know, in part, it, it seemed that it was rooted in, in a single organization and then you're kind of pairing up to, to do the behavior, mm -hmm. but only because you have to do that to have the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if you're thinking about it a little bit more, as Kanisha suggested, um, one of the works that popped into my mind was Fotini Christia's work on um, sort of alliance switching, basically, right? So they're also trying to stay alive and engage in different behaviors um, and reneging and mm -hmm. and that's sort of, so I don't know, I think um, that might help move in that direction, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what others say as well. One thing I wanted to add is, and I, I might have missed this in your paper, so if I did, I apologize, is also how you distribute ties among a multi-party alliance. So if you have like 17 groups, which happens in Syria mm -hmm. in a single operations mm -hmm. room, and then you're counting that incident like 17 factorial or whatever to kind of consider that every group in that alliance collaborated mm -hmm. with every other group, I think that that actually might cause some real problems if you're not then not mm -hmm. doing a network model, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there are some, I, I would, spend some more time thinking about the implications yeah. of that and trying it a bunch of ways and just comparing them so you do due diligence on that point yeah and i'll say too on on that point specifically that um <laughs> as we know one issue with the current ucdp data is that the rebel actors in syria are not very well laid out right in part because they're hard to identify right and the way i know that you you're you know, your work has has um, pulled that apart a little bit better. But um, so for that reason, in, in this data set, one limitation is that I just, because of all those problems, I just don't include Syria because it's such a weird outlier because I don't want it to like overly influence my results. That doesn't mean that I, I shouldn't in the future if I can, you know, kind of really get at these patterns and stuff. But at least at this stage, these results here don't, don't have that. 
Yeah, I'm not trying to talk about, so that's just the case that I'm using as an yeah. example. I think those same things, though, are happening in other conflicts like Mali, for example. There's a couple of big multi-party alliances there. So I do think mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. could be something that shifts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe there's a way to just kind of, um, and I hadn't thought about this before, but at the very least, I can kind of break down at the conflict level, see as a starting point, kind of look at the kind of um, differences between conflicts where we have multiple actors, but in some, we don't have any kind of cooperation in a given period of time. In some, we have everybody cooperating in some way. And in some, we have kind of some groups are cooperating with some groups, but not others. Just kind of maybe that like that would be a good kind of starting point because like you said, there are a like Afghanistan, right? This is a case where throughout the 80s, most of the groups that are at least in the UCDP data are, um, are all kind of allied in some way. And then it kind of in the late 80s, it broke up into kind of two, two big, uh, coalitions, right? So these kinds of things shifted, just like um, we see in um, Christia's work. Uh, so maybe that would be a starting point here. I'm not so sure. Can I, I mean, ask you a question, Brandon? Yeah, 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 please. So you, your affinity for, and I'm affinity, for the UCDP data in this project is because there's something about the participation in active conflict that generates this particular level of, of engagement? Or is it something about the type of organization that shows up in the data? I know I'm kind of harping on this conflict versus organization bit here, but I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of what squares your circle, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not mm -hmm. clear, I think to me, what the right direction to go in is for you, mm -hmm. unless we know what is the scope of the politics you're trying to explain, right? And I think like your your key mechanisms are all about sort of intra-organizational bargaining. And on top of that, we're trying to lay sort of all of these expectations about what happens in a particular conflict that's got these, mm -hmm. um, that's got these characteristics and over time, like that, that might not be relevant, right? Because you might mm -hmm. be telling a story about the rebel organization wheresoever you shall find it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. In in that case, like you, it's an empirical question whether or not the conflict yeah. level variation washes out. Yeah. yeah. And if I can two finger on this, I think this is well summarized by Kanisha's comments in the chat, which are that your hypotheses are both monadic and dyadic. And something that you said earlier about um, why is this sort of about these sort of institution of the alliance versus like initiate an alliance and i think that that matters on mm -hmm. this point too because what i what i hear and let me know if i'm mischaracterizing you but the way it resonates with me given the work i've done is that you could be focusing entirely on rebel group characteristics we'd be thinking a lot about rebel groups and rebel groups as these interesting organizations that have all these organizational problems and features and you're telling us how that matters for whether they go out and seek an alliance. To me, that's one paper. And a second paper is then when we go to the next level, we look at conflict, like Kanish is bringing up, and we look at a conflict story, we think a lot about ideology, we think a lot about spatial distance, we think a lot about past histories of conflict, we think a lot about relationship with civilians, and these things are a little bit easier to get at at the sort of meso analysis level, where you also can then look at it as a network and you can say yeah well i am able to control for you know the fact that these seven groups might just be um in sort of high homophily because they're all after the same goals and so that does drive a lot of alliance here but i'm also able to to code which ones have these sort of internal structures and i do think you're trying to do both kind of from what i'm hearing so um Kanisha, does that make sense with what you've been saying some yeah, I think the you just, I think Brandon, you just have to lean into the complexity, right? So <laughs> I think your hypotheses are well stated, right? You have to tell a monadic story to get to the mm -hmm. dyadic story. Mm -hmm. But then once you get to the dyadic story, you have to retain some of that mm -hmm. monadic explanation, right? And that's mm -hmm. what drops out in the way that mm -hmm. you've laid out the mm -hmm. argument. Mm 
And so that's where something like a network analysis will help you, but that I, I don't think you have to do that, right? Like there's all sorts of, like I'm saying, sort of work on multilateral cooperation that doesn't work from sort mm -hmm. of network um, perspective. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. that nesting, I think is important to getting to that ultimate sort of conflict level story that you wanna tell. And I'm mm. pretty sure that that's what you want to do, given the future work that you're doing, which focuses on conflict outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the when it comes to to these kind of multilateral cases, the you know, I've I've attempted to do as much as I possibly can to to get the kind of details about alliance relationships within each conflict but maybe then i also need to just spend even more time really digging into kind of like you were talking about these these really specific bilateral relationships that are kind of just nested within them and just 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 dig in qualitatively to just kind of figure out what's going on in a couple of cases and, and maybe that'll help help kind of um help unveil some of the story i i mean Politically, I know that you know from from some of the cases that I've read very deeply on, it does seem like the kind of you know relationships that groups have with other groups can affect whether you know they're willing to let another group into the alliance or something, right? Because you know we have this friend of a friend kind of dynamic sometimes, and sometimes we have this you know two groups are friends with each other, but you know group A likes group C as well, but group B hates group C, and so that causes these, these kind of problems. Um, it's just, you know, that's so difficult to measure too. So that, you know, that just becomes another, another issue that I'll just have to figure out. Um, I'm gonna know. jump in super quick and just, and then I'm gonna stop talking. Um, <laughs> and a, a case that you might wanna go to that I noticed doesn't show up in your data set, the AUC. And I know that sort of you're talking about, you know, that you're not gonna work with militias for, a, specific reason, whatever the reason is, it's fine, it's your reason. But I think that that is a case of a sort of very large umbrella organization where there are considerably um, contentious relationships among mm -hmm. many of the constituent organizations, mm -hmm. um, but that mm -hmm. wasn't a uniform condition, mm -hmm. right? So the AUC in the run-up to its first dissolution in 2002 looks very mm -hmm. different, sort of post-2005 in its reconstitution. And part of that is due to the nature of the alliance the alliance obligations, right? Mm -hmm. So the new pact that's written accounts for those bilateral relationships. I think even if you don't sort of provide us with the theory, right? Like this is like yeah. 10 years down the road, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Like you publish this book, you get all the other stuff done and you think about this. That is an example, I think, of how you can have almost completely contradictory bilateral relationships in mm -hmm. the context of a multilateral institutionalized mm -hmm. um, set of mm -hmm. commitments that sounds mm -hmm. perfect for, for where you're at. Mm. Yeah, Emily. I have a two finger on that, which is just that um, one, another thing that I've been thinking about in this just broad dynamic that I don't think is fair to ask you to tackle for this paper, but is just, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that I don't think rebel networks and particularly alliance networks are flat. I think they're extremely hierarchical, right? So you have like tactical brigades that cooperate and agree to cooperate in a certain region, but then the rest of the group doesn't cooperate with itself. And you have like, formal alliances among in, in a regional location, but not not across the conflict. And then you have like mergers and things like that, where some battalions are still fighting and splinter. So I think like leaning into and thinking about the complexity of that as a as a hierarchical network might also help you if you decide, especially to go qualitatively, pull apart some of the nuances and actually gain you theoretical leverage. Right. I think that's interesting. I don't think it hurts you. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to simplify it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very good idea. Um, I'll flag that we have you, about five minutes left, so we can kind of, you can ask to collect any other comments, or we can also try to discuss one other um, big, big picture point. Yeah, let's we, hit that other big picture point then, I suppose. Okay. So I always somehow silence the entire discussion when I remind people five minutes are up. That's not what I'm trying to do here. Okay. So, um, yeah, what other big, big picture thing might we, might we discuss last? Yeah. Um, you know, I think 
moving forward, the the biggest thing that well, one thing I I need help with is just figuring out how to best streamline the paper. And you know, maybe it's just that maybe it's that this is just not meant to be a standalone article. Maybe it's that um, you know the first step is maybe trying to just publish a data set paper. And then that kind of gives me more space to like work theoretically in the next next paper. Um, or maybe there's just kind of simplifications in the theory that I can I can make that aren't that aren't gonna pull away from the kind of contributions that I'm trying to make here. So any like last minute advice on how to streamline the project would be great. Rather than split, my thought, my first thought is rather than split data and theory, I would parse it vertically, like pick one of your theoretical chunks and do a whole paper on that. I don't think that, da I mean, I think you've done a phenomenal amount of work with the data here, but I think you're going to get more bang for your buck out of an article that doesn't just try to publish that as a data release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would second that. I would not start with a, a data paper. Um, I mean, I, that being said, I mean, I, I think you need, maybe this is exactly what Emily just said, but in a different way. Uh, I think you need less theory in the paper. Um, you need to yeah, pick a piece of, of what you want to share with the world um, about the project, um, which, I, you know, and there's a few ways to do that. I mean, one is to just like sit and think about it and decide what you want. You know, one is to try it unsuccessfully to get us to give our honest opinions about it, uh, which I, I think uh, nobody has like a clear answer. Um, another is to let the review process tell you, right, what's resonating. Um, and, and that's, you know, a different way to, to think about how to engage um, different pieces of the project. So I just put one suggestion um, in the chat um, to really go full bore on the monadic and the dyadic stories in the nesting and sort of make mm -hmm. it really clear to us and focus on that bit um, and just you know kind of footnote away the multilateral story for now. The thing that I would maybe be more excited to see selfishly is you take a step back and get up really high and tackle this sort of what am I talking about when I'm talking about a rebel alliance. There's different ways to approach this. Right, we could think about sort of from the interstate alliance perspective, we could think about it from the IO perspective, we could think about it from the sort of very deeply drilled actor centric perspective. And and talk us through the implications of that choice right yeah. like, do we do we have a set of consistent expectations. And if not, then that means that you've just told us that if we're going to do this kind of work, we need to be very careful about specifying not only scope conditions, but also units of analysis, which to me sounds like an excellent um, contribution for people that want to do this kind of work. Yeah, well, everyone, the, agrees, a great point. everyone agrees no data paper. So I think I was, I was <laughs> also going to say that, but I don't need to. So you yeah, have enough yeah. here um, for sure. So don't, don't feel like you don't, you know, it's just that there's a lot here and sort of figuring out those which blocks to highlight in this one paper and which to put elsewhere. I like the way, Emily, that you said the vertical like slice and paper. So I was like, ooh, I, this is a good visual. Like I'm taking from this as well. So um, with that, we are at the end of our time. So if y'all have any more comments uh, for Brandon, please feel free to share, but uh, it's not you know required. And thanks for those who attended. Um, Brandon, if I have anything to follow up with you, I will. And I'll just tell everyone, you know, online peace science colloquium, we post all these videos online so you can always share them. Uh, Brandon, I'm always told it's very helpful to go back and watch your own discussion since it's so much information. Uh, and we do have another talk coming up. Jennifer, do you know what date the talk is? I apologize. I do not have that on the top of my head right now. <laughs> Me neither. I forgot to write it down. But soon we have another one. It's in like two weeks. It'll be great. Um, so thank you all for being here. And if you have any follow up questions, please feel free to email me, feel free to email me and I'll see like half of you next week in Nashville. So safe travels, y'all. Thank you all so much. I'm very grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon.